Unstoppable. This is Stephen's story. That's what I've called it simply today, Stephen's story. Today, uh, we're going to take a closer look at Stephen. Uh, he was one of, if you remember, earlier in chapter 6, uh, one of the Hellenistic Jews that was chosen to take care of the needs of the Hellenistic widows in Jerusalem First Assembly. Uh, and as it turns out, he was and did much more than that. And Luke writes as much, and we're going to examine a little bit of that today. And uh, in the process of that, we're going to look at the longest recorded sermon in the whole book. We don't know how long he, he, you know, he actually took um, to say all this stuff. We only know what Luke wrote down, so don't feel bad. Um, there are other long-winded preachers. I mean, you know, Paul preached until people fell asleep and fell out windows and broke their necks and stuff. Of course, he went down and raised him from the dead. I don't know. Um, but this is a long sermon. And so today, um, it's probably going to take me a couple weeks to get through it. But we want to generally look at it today. And I want to uh, not just teach, but also kind of sermonize my way through it. And so uh, I'll be moving pretty quickly. So just fasten your seatbelts. At this point in history, a couple years into the church, uh, it's growing in number. And even a bunch of priests, we just found out, are getting saved, those people that operate in the temple. Um, but the opposition is also growing at the same time. And you know it takes heart, conviction. It takes faith and grit and guts to stand up for what is right. Uh, even when everybody, it seems like everybody is turning against you. And that's Stephen's story. Uh, he lived for Jesus, and so he also died as a result of that life for Jesus. He, stook, he stood strong, and he died well, not as an apostle, but as a regular member, just a lay leader in the early church. And his story, according to the narrative that Luke lays out, his story is the first of three stories there's Stephen's story, then there's Philip's story, and then there's Saul of, of Tarsus. It's his story that Luke records to show us how the gospel story, the story of Jesus, began to spread beyond Jerusalem um, and the Jewish community into the uttermost parts of the world. So this is a key happening in the life of the church. Everything has happened basically in Jerusalem up until this point. And this is the first of three stories that sets it off that Luke uses to tell how the gospel spread all around the Roman Empire. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. said this, uh, If a man has not yet discovered something for which he will die, he's not ready to live. That's Stephen's story. Our text today shows us the final days, maybe even the final day in the life of of Stephen, how he lived, what he said, and how he died. That's our outline for today. How he stood strong when it counted. And this morning as we work through this, I want to share maybe just a few lessons that we could all learn from his life and his death. And we'll start with how he lived. And the lesson might be standing strong may require us to stand alone. Verse 8 of chapter 6 says, Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. So here Luke reintroduces us to this guy named Stephen, one of the seven chosen, to serve the widows of the church. And obviously they had chosen well. Verse 5 says that he was a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And here we find out that Luke again describes him as a man full of God's grace and power. He is the first New Testament person other than Jesus and the apostles, to be mentioned, to be noted as a miracle worker. He's demonstrating the power of God and the grace that is on his life, confirming the message by the signs and wonders pointing to God that God has gifted him to do among the people. 
And a guy like this would naturally be a magnet for anybody who's in need. So he's a natural to meet the needs of the widows, but at the same time, a guy like this would also be, become a target for anybody who opposed the church. We got to take him down. Too much commotion is going on about this whole Jesus thing. We got to shut it down. Now it's not just the apostles. Oh no, this thing is spreading. And regular people are actually doing the work of the ministry, empowered by the Spirit. And that's exactly what happens. Verse 9, opposition arose, however, from the members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called. Sounds kind of Jewish, doesn't it? <laughs> freedmen, freedmen, freedmen. Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. Now it's not people from the temple, it's people from the synagogue. One of the synagogues, one of the 480 synagogues, they say, existed in Jerusalem in that day. And these were Stephen's cultural peers, Hellenized Jews, freed men. The freed men were probably Jewish slaves and their children who had been um, living outside of Jerusalem, outside the Holy Land. They had been slaves, but had been freed by Rome, and now they had returned to Jerusalem, and birds of a feather flocked together. They came together, and they formed as free men now, free Jews, Hellenized Jews, coming back home to Jerusalem. They form a cultural center known as a synagogue, where they do things like debate the meaning of Scripture. And so they began to argue with Stephen, who was no doubt bringing the heat, preaching Jesus, and they didn't like it. These are people from all over the place that have now, specifically, he names places that they came from. And these are Stephen's own people within the synagogue. Of course he has access to them. And what he's preaching about Jesus, they don't like. Verse 10 says, But they could not stand up against the wisdom and spirit that the Spirit gave him as he spoke. It was because of the Spirit working in Stephen that they couldn't stand up against his argument. And all of this then begins to, to sound very familiar they're probably thinking first it was Jesus. He had arguments and he shut us down every time. Then the apostles, they're doing the same thing. Now this guy, and it's not because he was a slick debater. It was because of the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. And he shut down their best debaters. And since they could not resist his argument, they arranged to have false witnesses, sound familiar, to bring charges of blasphemy Strong charges of blasphemy against him. Verse 11 says, Then they secretly persuaded some men. They bribed them. They persuaded them. They told them what to say and maybe even gave them the words to say. Hey, come here. We have a job for you. They secretly bribed them. Told them what to say. Say this, guys. We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And this is big stuff to the Jews. And so they stirred up the people, verse 12. That is the general population. This is the first time that the people begin to turn on the church. Remember, they've been celebrated in the communities. I mean, they found favor. Now, all of a sudden, because of this lying, blasphemous accusation brought by false witnesses, even the people. So it tells you how impactful this testimony is, this false testimony. Blasphemy against Moses, our lawgiver, and against God. Ultimately, I cannot believe this. We cannot accept this. And the people began, the general population, turn on them. And the elders, which probably refers to the Sadducees. And the teachers of the law, which probably refers to the Pharisees. Three groups that you would not want chasing you through the streets of Jerusalem in that day. Go after Stephen in hot pursuit. They, verse 13, 
Um, no, the end of verse 12. They see Stephen. And they brought him before the Sanhedrin. Remember, they're the Jewish Supreme Court. Verse 13, they produced false witnesses who testified. This fellow never stops speaking against this holy place, the temple where God dwells, supposedly, and uniquely deals with his people. And he never stops talking against the law. That is the law of Moses. This is code for our power base, the temple, and the authority, the law of Moses that we use to get rich and to keep people under our, under our control. He's challenging our religion, everything that we hold as being dear to a Jewish person. This guy's speaking against. I cannot believe it. Verse 14 says... For we have, and this is the evidence supposedly that they produce. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place. Like they're standing in the temple. And they twist his words. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place, this temple. And change the customs of Moses handed down to us. This is our deal. We have a corner, don't you know, on the God market. We don't like this at all. And so they twist his words. And they level this accusation against him. The same accusation that they leveled against Jesus in Matthew 26. What he probably said, what, what potentially Stephen would have said, this is completely hypothetical. The good news of Jesus is that you tried to destroy the temple of his body, but he raised it back up. And now every believer in Jesus has become a temple in which God dwells by his spirit. And the new law is the law of God implanted in every believer's heart. He wasn't talking about the physical temple. He was talking about the temple of his body. And you destroyed it, but he raised it back up. And now as a result of his raising that temple back up, he has sent his Holy Spirit to indwell every person. They become living temples for God. The truth is, you see, Christ changes more than customs that you're so worried about. Your own little deal. Christ changes all that. He revolutionizes the way that we live. He is the ultimate revolutionary of tremendous proportion. And he starts not with this place, but with your heart. And people don't like that. Do you? If God could peek inside of your heart and see what's there sometimes. I bet you wouldn't like it either. He would have said, Jesus didn't nullify Moses' law, he completely fulfilled it. And they couldn't deal with it. And they refused to believe. After the false witnesses had finished twisting Stephen's words, everyone turned to Stephen for his response. And you can imagine the scene. All who were sitting, verse 15, in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen. And they saw that his face was like the face of of an angel. I'm like, what in the world is going on here? This is a Jewish description of a devout man. A person who is so close to God that he reflects some of God's own glory as a result of being in God's presence. This was a man, in other words, full of God's spirit. His grace and his power. A man whose face radiated just like Moses. <laughs> Remember? <laughs> You're destroying all the customs of Moses. No, now right in front of him. Right in front of the people who knew. 
about Moses' glowing face when he came down from the mount being in the presence of God. So much so that he had to veil himself. Now they're looking at somebody that has a calm and a cool presence about them because their conscience is clear. They ha he has not said anything like they've accused him of saying he is not attacking the temple. He's saying God's plans have progressed beyond what you're ready to accept. You got all the power now, you think. But all that power has just shifted to Jesus. I think they would hardly miss the connection of Stephen's face like an angel and Moses and the glory that was upon him. His appearance was the evidence of divine vindication and an indication of inspiration to make a defense. He was ready. A spiritual attractiveness marked by confidence, serenity, and courage he looked different because he'd been with Jesus. I wonder if they could say the same about me or you. And I don't know what Caiaphas, the high priest, was thinking, or maybe this is Annas. We know that Caiaphas was technically the high priest, but his father-in-law was still considered the high priest. He'd been the high priest before him, but the old dude wielded more power, probably. We don't know what the high priest was thinking, at that very moment. Maybe he was thinking, hey, this guy won't answer. I remember when we questioned Jesus and he didn't say anything. We charged him with the same stuff and he just shut his mouth and wouldn't talk to us. And so then the high priest, probably emboldened, asked Stephen, are these charges true? But boy, was he wrong. Stephen would not keep his mouth shut. Stephen stood strong before the council and he disabused. He spoke so as to persuade the religious leaders of their fallacies under which they existed. All of this power is a false power. You think you're doing God's business, but you're not. To answer the charges, then, he comes down on three pillars of Judaism. God and his relationship to his people and the land, the law and Moses and the temple. Three pillars false bases for the confidence that they had before God. And at that moment, he stood alone among men, but he stood strong because the Spirit of God was in him. And this is what he said. I mean, they brought him to trial, and, they took him, and he took him to school. There was no doubt. Stephen clearly understood the implications of the death, resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus. And he knew that the Jewish religious system had to give way to Christianity because Jesus was the fulfillment of all that Judaism stood for. One commentator, his last name is Gur, Jewish, he said this, this is more than a Jewish history lesson that Stephen's getting ready to embark on. It is the initial systematic theological presentation of the universal applicability and intent of the gospel solidly rooted in the Old Testament. Unlike Peter and Paul, who in their sermons used the Hebrew scriptures to support their arguments, for Stephen, the Hebrew scriptures are his argument. And someone else said, Stephen did not mount a defense. He assembled a prosecution. And he begins to talk about God and the land, one of the, their pillars. To this, he replied, hey, Stephen, do you have anything to say? To this, he replied. But he doesn't directly answer the accusation. It must have been frustrating. In the Old Testament, Jews never disassociate God's blessing from his gift of a specific parcel of land. The promised land, Israel, the holy land. And these leaders were no different. Hey, we're in the land we must be experiencing God's blessing. We must be doing all of this right. And they tied God to his blessing. And, he, and they tied God to his blessing because they lived in the land and it looked as if they were prospering. These were the most influential people in all of the land. Isn't that the way of it? People who tend to prosper a little bit more think that that's a sign of God's blessing. And you know what happens over time? They begin to think that people who aren't so prosperous maybe aren't being blessed of God. And their litmus test, in part, was the fact that they were in the land and that they were prospering. This must be a sign of God's blessing. 
And Stephen just blows this out of the water right here. It doesn't mean nearly as much to us as it does to them as I look through this. He says, you have more faith in the land than you have in God. And so he takes off with this. Brothers and fathers, listen to me. This is, these are terms of endearment, terms of respect. The God of glory appeared, and he uses three examples here, so I'm going to skip around a little bit, okay? The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. I mean, he's way back at the beginning. While he was still in Mesopotamia. That's not Israel. Before he lived in Haran, which is also not in Israel. Verse 3 says, Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. God met Abraham when he wasn't in the land. Don't you remember? Then he skips to the next person, verse 9. Because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, he says, they sold him as a slave into Egypt. Egypt is not the promised land. But God was with him. Where? In Egypt. Verse 10. And rescued him from all of his troubles. He gave Joseph wisdom and enabled him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. So Pharaoh made him ruler over Egypt and all of his palace. Genesis 37 through 41. Egypt is not the promised land. And look how God worked with Joseph. And then he goes to Moses. Okay, you want to talk about Moses? Here you go. When Moses heard of this. Now I know I'm skipping some. This is verse 29. When Moses heard this, he fled Midian. Or he fled to Midian, where he settled as a foreigner and had two sons. Midian is not the promised land. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai, which is not the promised land. And when he saw this, he was amazed at the sight. As a matter of fact, we sang a song about this today. Did you know that? Yahweh? <laughs> this is where God reveals his name to Moses. Yahweh. As a matter of fact, we don't even know how to say it. Uh, you heard it maybe on the video. Maybe you heard it. Maybe you didn't. The letters are yod Hey vav Hey. There's no vowels. Those are the, uh, the Hebrew letters. No, no vowels. So you don't really know how to pronounce it. And they didn't say it for so long that nobody really knows how to pronounce it until probably about the 5th or 6th century A.D. Hundreds and hundreds of years went by. And some guys came along and said, hey, we better figure out how to make this pronounceable because they're trying to do away with the Jews and their language. So, we be so they added in the Hebrew vowel points to let everybody know who's reading it how this should be pronounced. But nobody really knows. It remains, whether we like it or not, unpronounceable due to reverence. It is the ineffable name of God. This is the scene that unfolds right here. And Stephen says, don't you know Moses was in Midian and God shows up in a burning bush and reveals himself to him. And this is what he said, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses trembled with fear and did not dare look. Verse 33, then the Lord said to him, take off your sandals for this place where you are standing is holy ground. This is not Israel. God appears to people. In other words, you got this all wrong. Don't you even know your own history? God is not a God who is limited to geographical places only, such as the land of Israel. But God is the God of the whole world. He pointed out that the true God of glory cannot be limited to Israel, not to, not to Jerusalem, and not even to the temple, this place. He is the God of the whole world. The great fathers, Abraham, Joseph, and Moses, had all met and worshipped God outside the geographical boundaries of Israel. God deals with people wherever and whenever he wills. And I could hear, perhaps, Stephen saying, at least in my own words, you know this. You don't have a corner on the God market. Guys, it's never really been about the land. None of these guys ever even lived here. It's about God meeting people where they are. 
Living in the Holy Land doesn't mean that you're living in God's blessing, and it doesn't mean that you're holy either. You need Jesus in your heart. The one God sent to meet us where we are. Just like God met Abe and Joe and Mo. And then speaking of Mo, he starts to talk about Moses and the law. Verse 37. This is the Moses who told the Israelites, as if there's some other Moses, right? This is the Moses who told the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your own people. This is big. Verse 38. He was in the assembly in the wilderness. So God provided. God met them in the wilderness too, by the way. So he doesn't say as much, but that's the implication here. Yeah, no, God met our people in the wilderness. They weren't even in the land yet. He was in the assembly in the wilderness with the, with, with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our ancestors. And he received living words. That is the law, the very law of God, the very words of God to pass on to us. The things that were supposed to give us life and define us as a people. The things you seem to worship. Verse 39, but our ancestors refused to obey him. That is Moses. Instead, they rejected him. And in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt, back to slavery, and back to idolatry. The very slavery and idolatry that they had been captive to for over 400 years. They turned back to that. They told Aaron, make us gods. Make us a sacred calf. Make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow, Moses, who led us out of Egypt, we don't even know what's happened to him. He's up on the mount of God, getting the words of life, and they think he's been up there too long. And they're ready to throw in the towel already. Guys, he's been up there too long. The purpose of the law, though, they, they missed it, was to pinpoint the need for salvation. And to point out that Jesus is the prophet that Moses spoke about. The law was never intended to be an end in itself. But you keep looking to it as if it is. You cling to your legalistic ways. As if they could save you. And you also look to Moses. As if he's the savior. When he looked to somebody else. They accuse Stephen of blaspheming Moses and the law. And maybe they're the same here. Moses and the law can be used interchangeably. And so his response is, you have been breaking, if you read the text, you've been breaking the law of Moses all of your lives. And because you've, re because you've rejected Moses, you have rejected the truth then about Jesus, the one that he spoke about. As a matter of fact, he goes on to say that the ancestors of the present religious leaders have all rejected God's prophets including Moses. They had rejected the keeping of the law and in doing so had rejected the true worship of God. Claiming to be guardians of the law while breaking it all along. This very trial is a travesty of justice. They broke the law by bringing in false witnesses. And now they're trying to dump it on Stephen. Proof of his point. Not to mention the fact that you so-called law keepers, guardians of the law, you keep throwing Moses up in everybody's face as if you're living up to his standards too, and you're not, and everybody knows it. You're not justified in his sight. Just because you revere Moses doesn't make you right in the sight of God. It was as if they were worshiping Moses, a mere man. They were idolaters like their forefathers in the wilderness. And putting their faith in the law and the slavery that came with it. He's saying, you want to talk about the law and Moses? You're doing the same thing that brought God's judgment on our fathers. And you're trying to pin the blame on me. But your own accusation will turn out to be your own condemnation. We think we have a neat little hold on God just like they did. God has given us Moses and the law, right? He's even given us Jesus. 
He didn't give it to other people, but to us, yes. He's saying if you were faithful to your own scriptures, you would see that Jesus is the only way and you would let all of this other stuff go. And brothers and sisters, we do the same thing. We hold on to our own little sacred calves in idolatry and we begin to worship them instead of Jesus. That's the indictment that he issues against them. It's very powerful. He says you need Jesus, not Moses or the law. And then he jumps to the temple. He's bringing it home, verse 48 through 50. However, the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or well, where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all of these things? Isaiah 66, 1 and 2a. In other words, the day of the temple is past. It was built by a man, Solomon, and again by another man, Zerubbabel. That's the second temple. We're standing in the complex right now. It's being renovated by another man named Herod. This very temple that we're standing in, it has been a blessing, yeah. But its usefulness is now passing away because the Lord Jesus Christ has now come. He is the real temple that this temple pointed to. He came and tabernacled among us. Don't you know, brothers? And all who believe in him themselves become little temples, little tabernacles in which the spirit of the living God dwells. Once we put our faith in him. This has been holy ground, yes. But now, wherever the church goes, you see, that's holy ground. You can't relegate God to this spot. He's way bigger than that. It is impossible that the temple nor any other place made with hands can contain God, the creator of the universe. It's funny that Stephen had stopped short of the full quote from Isaiah. I'm sure that he did it on purpose. It makes perfect sense Jewish-wise because they knew where he was going with it and he didn't even have to say it. He let it stick in their own hearts because Isaiah goes on to say, these are the ones I look on with favor. Those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. God has planned, in other words, to put his spirit in man all along and you missed it. You got so wrapped up with the tabernacle and with the temple that you missed what God was pointing to with all of those. You put all of your faith, all of your confidence in a building and you're worshiping the building, not the God of the building. Just because this temple is still standing does not guarantee that you're right with God. He is looking at your heart. And you have made this complex more important than him. This has become your sacred calf. An idol that contains somehow God. A God that you can control. And before we start pointing fingers, we do exactly the same thing. Maybe we have a few sacred cows of our own. Maybe we try to package God in some neat little way that he fits all of our purposes. And we enjoy the package and we begin to worship the package because this is the way that God works and I have a corner on all of it. If I just do this, he always comes through. I can manipulate God. And in some subtle ways, we all do that. We have a perception of God. But God is so much larger than anything that we can even conceive of. That our minds can contrive. There's no way that you can keep God in a little package that fits all of your wants and desires. He's much bigger than that. And we want a temple 
that meets our status quo, that keeps everything on an even keel and always works out for us. That's what we want. Stephen is saying, that's not the God that you say you worship. You've reduced him to an idol. And you call the idol a temple where God's presence supposedly dwells. And you can imagine at this point exactly how unpopular Stephen becomes in this moment. But sometimes standing strong may require telling the truth even when it's unpopular. And he isn't done yet. He makes it personal. He shifts tenses from past to present and changes pronouns from they and them to you. And he goes Old Testament prophet on them. Verse 51. You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You refuse to bend, in other words, to the will of God. You say that you're faithful Jews, but your hearts still refuse to believe. You are proving yourselves to be uncircumcised Gentiles who you despise. You hypocrites. You're just a bunch of religious folk playing church. And you are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Verse 52. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. Notice in the whole sermon, Jesus, uh, Stephen has not mentioned the name of Jesus even once. Remember? Remember? Get out of here and stop using the name. Stephen is on trial. He's not even going to let them at this point use that against him. He refuses to say the name. He uses a Jewish euphemism really for God. And he calls Jesus the righteous one. Now in no uncertain terms, he references the very one that they have resisted. And he equates him with God, the righteous one. And he says this, you have received the law that has given, that was given through angels, but you have not obeyed it. The law pointed to him, and you refused to obey it, and you're accusing me of being guilty of it. You're trying to pin all of this on me. You so-called keepers of the law are really law breakers. I'm not guilty of blasphemy. You are. There are only two ways that you can deal with a stiff-necked person. You can bend their neck to the will of God, or God can break your neck. That's it. You can either yield to God now, or you must assuredly bow to Him the day you stand before Him. And on that day, there will be no argument, no trial. On that day, all mouths will be shut before the righteous one of God. And that was all they could take. Standing strong may require you suffer and even die. This is how Stephen died. I'm wrapping this up, guys. Verse 54. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and they gnashed their teeth at him. <gasps> He's going to die now. Not tomorrow, now. The trial's over. No sage like Gamaliel was going to step in with some wisdom and stop the train that was on the roll. They went out of their minds. They were full of raging anger and they started clenching and grinding their teeth, biting loudly and vigorously like a wild animal. In contrast to this rising fervor, of this religious mob, Stephen was at peace. Can you imagine? I mean, this is only God. As they came at him, his attention turned to heaven. Verse 55, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Verse 56, look, he said, Almost as if they're not there. Or he wants them to turn and look and see what he's seeing. He says, look, I see heaven open. And the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And this, for those religious leaders, is utterly over the top. 
What he sees and says has just placed Jesus at the highest place imaginable, even equating him with God, and he's not seated like in every other mention in all of the New Testament, but he is standing, perhaps he is standing to welcome Stephen as the first martyr of the church, or perhaps he is standing, some say, to plead Stephen's case, or he was standing as Daniel saw him. The Son of Man, divine, approaching the Ancient of Days, ready to come forth in judgment on the nations, however they took it. Their homicidal tendencies could no longer be contained. Verse 57, at this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. This is totally illegal behavior. Maybe they could say it was a crime of passion. When logic fails, then stones will do, I guess. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats. Ah, ha, ha, Luke is brilliant. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. You see, standing strong like Stephen will always leave a lasting impression. Verse 59, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against me, against them. He was for Jesus in his life. How much more was he like him in his death? And when he'd said this, he fell asleep, which is a euphemism in the New Testament for death. Because death is nothing more than a nap until Jesus comes to awake the faithful one last time. Though it may seem that Stephen's life ended in defeat because he did not live to see the fruit of this day, God revealed later that his life and death left a lasting impression. A man who was present at his stoning, his name was Saul. He never forgot the witness of Stephen's life and his death on that day. Saul, who was later renamed Paul, near the end of his life and in this book, clearly stated that he added his vote to the Sanhedrin's death sentence. Check it out, Acts 26.10. It is fully plausible then that Stephen's death was the cause, was a cause, of the gnawing questions in the heart of Saul of Tarsus that would prepare him for his confrontation with the risen Lord on the road to Damascus. I believe very probably that when Jesus told Saul on the road to Damascus that it was hard for him to kick against the goads, that one of those goads that Paul was fighting against, kicking against, was a testimony of Stephen's life. After all, wasn't it Paul who said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain? And death will ultimately bring out, reveal what each of us truly is. Stephen lived his last hours as Christ would have. He died a martyr's death as Christ did. He stood strong through the matchless grace of God. May God give us the grace of Stephen. If today were your final day, what would others like Luke write about us? Will they say they stood strong like Stephen when it counted? If a man has not yet discovered something for which to die, he is not ready to live. This is Stephen's story. The story of the book of Acts. The very story that invites us to join today.
maybe you're guilty of some of the things that Stephen accused the religious leaders of his day of. Maybe you have some sacred calves. Maybe you love the Bible more than Jesus. You get all wrapped up in the words. Forget about the person. Maybe you think that you're okay because you go to church. Don't you know how much I give? Don't you know how long I've gone there? Don't you know I was part of it when it first started? All those things that we hold so dear can become so detrimental to our relationship with Jesus. Legalism. And thinking that we're justified because we look this way and do these things. Never made anybody right in God's sight. Ever. Can we stand strong like Stephen? And would somebody write about us that when it counted, we did the same? Stand with me if you would. So I just looked at the clock and I cringed. But if you stuck around, maybe I was talking to you. I know I was talking to me. So all I can do right now really is pray a prayer of dedication and consecration over our lives. And ask that God would give us the confidence and the courage that we need when that day comes for us. Lord, I thank you for your congregation of believers here today. I pray that our hearts would be pure before you, that anything that we would hold more dear than you, that we would set it aside in our lives and we would focus wholly on you so that when our day comes, we can stand strong, so that when we become unpopular, we still focus on you, so that our lives will leave a lasting impression on those who come behind us, not because of us, but because of the grace that has been evident in our lives in the most critical times. God, may we always stand strong, no matter what, for you. And may we follow Stephen's example, who followed Christ's example. Each one of our hearts, may it be open to what it is that you're speaking to us today. Holy Spirit, come and irritate our hearts and help us to stop fighting against you and repent. Ask forgiveness and turn our hearts wholly to you. That's our prayer, Lord, today. Honor it according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen.